Hello everyone! As so many of you asked me to read the young visitors out loud for you, I've decided to do that today. This novel, The Young Visitors, was written by Daisy Ashford, who was a nine-year-old girl at the time that she wrote it, at the very end of the Victorian era. I fell in love with it when I read it. It's so rich in descriptions of that time, seen through the eyes of a child. I particularly love the way she describes the colours in every room. It's beautiful and I'm very excited to share it with you. I'm not going to read the preface because I always find that reading the preface before you read the rest spoils it a little bit, so I tend to read the preface at the end. In this case, it's written by J.M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan, and I will read it to you, but after I've read the novel. So here we go. The Young Visitors by Daisy Ashford. Chapter One. Quite a young girl. Mr Saltina was an elderly man of 42 and was fond of asking people to stay with him. He had quite a young girl staying with him of 17 named Ethel Montague. Mr Saltina had dark short hair and moustache and whiskers which were very black and twisty. He was middle-sized and he had very pale blue eyes. He had a pale brown suit but on Sundays he had a black one and he had a topper every day as he thought it more becoming. Ethel Montague had fair hair done on the top and blue eyes. She had a blue velvet frock which had grown rather short in the sleeves. She had a black straw hat and kid gloves. One morning, Mr Saltina came down to breakfast and found Ethel had come down first, which was strange. Is the tea made, Ethel? he said, rubbing his hands. Yes, said Ethel, and such a queer-shaped parcel has come for you. Yes, indeed, it was a queer-shaped parcel. It was a hat box tied down very tight and a letter stuffed between the string. Well, well, said Mr Saltina, parcels do turn queer. I will read the letter first. And so saying, he tore open the letter. And this is what it said. My dear Alfred, I want you to come for a stop with me. So I've sent you a top hat wrapped up in tissue paper inside the box. Will you wear it staying with me? Because it is very uncommon. Please bring one of your young ladies, whichever is the prettiest in the face. I remain yours truly, Bernard Clark. Well, said Mr Saltina, I shall take you to stay, Ethel. And fancy him sending me a top hat. Then Mr S opened the box and there lay the most splendid top hat of a lovely rich tone, rather like grapes, with a ribbon round complete. Well, said Mr Saltina peevishly, I don't know if I shall like it. The bow of the ribbon is too flighty for my age. Then he sat down and ate the egg which Ethel had so kindly laid for him. After he had finished his meal, he got down and began to write to Bernard Clark. He ran upstairs on his fat legs and took out his blotter with a loud sniff. And this is what he wrote. <laughs> My dear Bernard, certainly I shall come and stay with you next Monday. I will bring Ethel Montague, commonly called Miss M. She is very active and pretty. I do hope I shall enjoy myself with you. I am fond of digging in the garden and I am partial to ladies if they are nice. I suppose it is my nature. I'm not quite a gentleman, but you would hardly notice it, but can't be helped anyhow. We will come by the 3.15. Your old and valued friend, Alfred Saltina. Perhaps my readers will be wondering why Bernard Clark had asked Mr Saltina to stay with him. He was a lonely man in a remote spot and he liked people and parties, but he did not know many. What rot, muttered Bernard Clark as he read Mr Saltina's letter. He was rather a presumptuous man. Chapter Two, Starting Gaily. When the great morning came, Mr Saltina did not have an egg for his breakfast in case he should be sick on the journey. What top hat will you wear? asked Ethel. I shall wear my best black and my white alpaca coat to keep off the dust and flies, replied Mr Saltina. I shall put some red rouge on my face, said Ethel, because I'm very pale owing to the drains in this house. You will look very silly, said Mr Saltina with a dry laugh. Well, so will you, said Ethel in a snappy tone, and she ran out of the room with a very superior run, throwing out her legs behind and her arms swinging in rhythm. Well, said the owner of the house, she has a most idiotic run. 
presently, Ethel came back in her best hat and a lovely velvet coat of royal blue. Do I look nice in my get-up? she asked. Mr Saltina surveyed her. You look rather fresh, my dear. Your colours don't quite match your face. But never mind. I'm just going up to say goodbye to Rosalind, the housemaid. Well, don't be long, said Ethel. Mr S skipped upstairs to Rosalind's room. Goodbye, Rosalind, he said. I shall be back soon, and I hope I shall enjoy myself. I make no doubt of that, sir, said Rosalind with a blush, as Mr Saltina silently put two and six on the dirty toilet cover. Take care of your bronchitis, said Mr S rather bashfully, and he hastily left the room, waving his hand carelessly to the housemaid. Come along, cried Ethel, powdering her nose in the hall. Let us get into the cab. Mr Saltina did not care for powder, but he was an unselfish man, so he dashed into the cab. Sit down, said Ethel, as the cabman waved his whip. You're standing on my luggage. Well, I'm paying for the cab, said Mr S, so I might be allowed to put my feet where I like. They travelled second class in the train, and Ethel was longing to go first, but thought perhaps least said soonest mended. Mr Saltina got very excited in the train about his visit. Ethel was calm, but she felt excited inside. Bernard has a big house, said Mr S, gazing at Ethel. He is inclined to be rich. Oh, indeed, said Ethel, looking at some cows flashing past the window. Mr S felt rather disheartened, so he read the paper till the train stopped and the porters shouted, Rickamere Station! We better collect our traps, said Mr Saltina. And just then, a very exalted footman in a cocked hat and olive green uniform put his head in at the window. Are you from Rickamere Hall? he said in impressive tones. Well, yes, I am, said Mr Saltina, and so is this lady. Very good, sir, said the noble footman. If you will alight, I will see to your luggage. There is a conveyance awaiting you. Oh, thank you, thank you, said Mr Saltina, and he and Ethel stepped along the platform. Outside, they found a lovely carriage lined with olive green cushions to match the footman and the horses had green bridles and bows on their manes and tails. They got gingerly in. Will he bring our luggage? asked Ethel nervously. I expect so, said Mr Saltina, lighting a very long cigar. Do we tip him? asked Ethel quietly. Well, no, I don't think so. Not yet. We'd better just thank him politely. Just then, the footman staggered out with the baggage. Ethel bowed gracefully over the door of the carriage, and Mr S waved his hand as each bit of luggage was hoisted up to make sure it was all there. Then he said, Thank you, my good fellow, very politely. Not at all, sir, said the footman, and touching his cocked hat, he jumped actively to the box. I was right not to tip him, whispered Mr Saltina. The thing to do is to leave two and six on your dressing table when your stay is over. Does he find it? asked Ethel, who did not really know at all how to go on a visit. I believe so, replied Mr Saltina. Anyhow, it is quite the custom and we can't help it if he does not. Now, my dear, what do you think of the scenery? Very nice, said Ethel, gazing at the rich fur rug on her knees. Just then, the carriage rolled into a beautiful drive with tall trees and big red flowers growing amid shiny dark leaves. Presently, the haughty coachman pulled up with a great clatter at a huge front door with tall pillars, each side a big iron bell and two very clean scrapers. The doors flung open as if by magic, causing Ethel to jump, and a portly butler appeared on the scene with a very shiny shirt front and a huge pale face. Welcome, sir, he exclaimed good-naturedly as Mr Saltina alighted rather quickly from the vehicle, and pleased to step inside. Mr Saltina stepped in as bid, followed by Ethel. The footman again struggled with the luggage and the butler, Francis Minnett by name, kindly lent a hand. The hall was very big and hung round with guns and mats and ancestors, giving it a gloomy but a grand air. The butler then showed them down a winding corridor till he came to a door which he flung open, shouting, Mr Saltina and a lady, sir! A tall man of 29 rose from the sofa. He was rather bent in the middle, with very nice long legs, fairish hair and blue eyes. Hello, Alf, old boy, he cried. So you've got here all safe and no limbs broken? None, thank you, Bernard, replied Mr Saltina, shaking hands. And let me introduce Miss Montague. She's very pleased to come for this visit. Oh, yes, gasped Ethel, blushing through her red rouge. 
Bernard looked at her keenly and turned a dark red. I'm glad to see you, he said. I hope you will enjoy it, but I have not arranged any parties yet, as I don't know anybody. Don't worry, murmured Ethel. I don't mix much in society. And she gave him a dainty smile. I expect you'd like some tea, said Bernard. I will ring. Yes, indeed we should, said Mr Saltina eagerly. Bernard peeled on the bell and the butler came in with a stately walk. Tea, please, Minute, cried Bernard Clark. With pleasure, sir, replied Minute with a deep bow. A glorious tea then came in on a gold tray, two kinds of bread and butter, a lovely jam roll and lots of sugar cakes. Ethel's eyes began to sparkle and she made several remarks during the meal. I expect you would now like to unpack, said Bernard when it was over. Well, yes, that is rather an idea, said Mr Saltina. I've given the best spare room to Miss Montague, said Bernard with a gallant bow, and yours, turning to Mr Saltina, opens out of it, so you'll be nice and friendly. Both the rooms have big windows and a handsome view. How charming, said Ethel. Yes, well, let's go up, replied Bernard, and he led the way up many a winding stairway till they came to an oak door with some lovely swans and bulrushes painted on it. Here we are, he cried gaily. Ethel's room was indeed a handsome compartment with purple silk curtains and a four-post bed draped with the same shade. The toilet set was white and mauve and there were some violets in a costly vase. Oh, I say, cried Ethel in surprise. I'm glad you like it, said Bernard. And here we have yours, Alf. He opened the dividing doors and portrayed a smaller but dainty room all in pale yellow and wild primroses. My own room is next the bathroom, said Bernard. It is decorated dark red, as I have sombre tastes. The bathroom has got a tip-up basin and a hose thing for washing your hair. A good notion, said Mr Saltina, who was secretly getting jealous. Here we will leave our friends to unpack and end this chapter. Chapter 3. The First Evening when they had unpacked, Mr Saltina and Ethel went downstairs to dinner. Mr Saltina had put on a complete evening suit, as he thought it was the correct idea, and some ruby studs he'd got at a sale. Ethel had on a dress of yellow silk, covered with tulle, which was quite in the fashion, and she had on a necklace which Mr Saltina gave her for a birthday present. She looked very becoming and pretty, and Bernard heaved a sigh as he gave her his arm to go into dinner. The butler Minute was quite ready for the fray, standing up very stiff and surrounded by two footmen in green plush and curly white wigs who were called Charles and Horace. Well, said Mr Saltina, lapping up his turtle soup, you have a very sumptuous house, Bernard. His friend gave a weary smile and swallowed a few drops of sherry wine. It is fairly decent, he replied with a bashful glance at Ethel. After our repast, I will show you over the premises. Many thanks, said Mr Saltina, getting rather flustered with his forks. You ought to give a ball, remarked Ethel. You have such large compartments. Yes, there's room enough, sighed Bernard. We might try a few steps and meanwhile I might get to know a few people. So you might, responded Ethel, giving him a speaking look. Mr Saltina was growing a little peevish, but he cheered up when the port wine came on the table and the butler put round some costly finger bowls. He did not have any in his own house and he followed Bernard's clerk's advice as to what to do with them. After dinner, Ethel played some merry tunes on the piano and Bernard responded with a rather loud song in a bass voice and Ethel clapped him a good deal. Then Mr Saltina asked a few riddles, as he was not musical. Then Bernard said, Shall I show you over my domain? and they strolled into the gloomy hall. I see you have a lot of ancestors, said Mr Saltina in a jealous tone. Who are they? Well, said Bernard, they're all quite correct. This is my Aunt Caroline. She was rather eccentric and quite old. So I see, said Mr Saltina, and he passed on to a lady with a very tight waist and queerly shaped. That's Marianne Fudge, my grandmother, I think, said Bernard. She was very well known in her day. Why? asked Ethel, who was rather curious by nature. Well, I don't know, said Bernard, but she was. And he moved away to the next picture. 
It was of a man with a fat, smiley face and a red ribbon round him and a lot of medals. My great uncle, Ambrose Fudge, said Bernard carelessly. Well, he looks a thorough ancestor, said Ethel kindly. Well, he was, said Bernard in a proud tone. He was really the sinister son of Queen Victoria. Not really, cried Ethel in excited tones. But what does that mean? Well, I don't quite know, said Bernard. It puzzles me very much, but ancestors do turn queer at times. Perhaps it means godson, said Mr Saltina in an intelligent voice. Well, I don't think so, said Bernard, but I mean to find out. Well, it's very grand anyhow, said Ethel. It is that, replied her host genially. Who is this, said Mr Saltina, halting at a picture of a lady holding up some grapes and smiling a good deal. Her name was called Minnie Pilato, responded Bernard. She was rather far back, but a real relation, and she was engaged to the Earl of Tully Varden, only it did not quite come off. What a pity, cried Ethel. Yes, it was rather, replied Bernard, but she married a captain in the Navy and had seven children, so she was quite all right. Here, Mr Saltina thought he had better go to bed, as he'd had a long journey. Bernard always had a few prayers in the hall and some whisky afterwards, as he was rather pious, but Mr Saltina was not very addicted to prayers, so he marched up to bed. Ethel stayed as she thought it would be a good thing. The butler came in as he was a very holy man, and Bernard piously said the Our Father, and a very good hymn called I Will Keep My Anger Down, and a decad of the rosary. Ethel chimed in quietly, and Francis Minute was most devout, and Ethel thought, what a good holy family she was stopping with. So I will end my chapter. Now it's time for me to turn to my tea, which has got a little cold. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think so far. The next half gets very exciting. I hope you're safe and well wherever you are. See you in the next video.